May, I think, working in the project the Scholar, um, the Rania Coherent Structures. Well, Vincent Rossi did his PhD in 2010 under the supervision of Veronica Song, a professor in Toulouse, I think it was, the laboratory of spatial oceanography. Then he went for two years and a half to Australia, to the University of New South Wales, also working in oceanography. And now he and then he moved to, to Ifix. He's a oceanographer working both in physical oceanography and marine biology. And today he's going to talk us about some work he has been doing in the last years about the range of ocean circulation. Thank you very much, Cristobal. Good morning, everyone. Um, so, I, as Cristobal said, I'm going to, um, I mean, the, the work I'm going to talk about now is um, part of the work I did in the last two years in Australia, um, but I, I would like to mention it was not necessarily the core of my project there, um, so I was essentially doing some work based on data and really oceanographic type of studies that I, I decided not to talk about here because it didn't fit really with the audience, neither with the, the project I'm doing now. So, so this is some... Uh, Lagrangian studies of the ocean circulation I've been doing in the last two years. Um, some of the one of the examples is I was, I was leading the study. The other one I was I was only co-authoring the studies. Um, and so um, I'm just going to start with a, a very brief introduction. Um, and for this we have to come back to the 18th centuries, um, where so that was the the century of I mean the age of enlightenment, where scientists were uh, multidisciplinary and very brilliant. I guess Ifis would be happy about leaving this career. <laughs> um, so you had Euler here. Um, so er early of the 18th centuries, um, you can see he did a lot of stuff. Uh, but here I'm mainly focusing on his, his important discovery in fluid dynamics. And so he was one of the first um, to, to describe a, a flow um, with what we call the early end coordinates. So the, the idea of this is that uh, the point of reference is stationary, and then the flow move around uh, the point of reference. So, as a very a simple example, is uh, a tree growing in a river banks and looking at the, at the water passing passing by in front of you. And um, a few years later, so indeed, this uh, Joseph Louis Lagrange was mentored in, indeed by Euler, and and so then he, he came up with a new a new view of fluid dynamics, which which now we call the Lagrangian view. And so in that case, um, the point of reference moves, moves with the flow. And so coming back to the simple example, it would be like a piece of wood drifting down the river within the water, um, so passing by in front of the, of the tree. And of course, uh, there is a physical connection between these two views uh, that is um, uh, described by this simple equation that reads, um, so here you've got the early end velocity field V at a point in space X and at time T. And so the early end velocity field should be equal to uh, the Lagrangian displacement of the particle over a uh, short uh, time dt. Um, so another example of, of this early end Lagrangian specification of flow field, and that fits better with the field of oceanography, is let's consider evolving temperature or velocity field. Uh, so Euler will, will see that as a fixed grid of temperature values and velocities. And in, within this grid, there are both temperature and momentum that flows through the grid. And uh, so for the same system, Lagrangian will describe it as a set of moving particles, and each of the particles will have a temperature value and, and an interest in velocity. Um, and so these two views have, have a lot of impact. I mean, in the field of oceanography, there are mainly two impacts. The first one is in the way we observe the ocean. Um, and so, um, there are two types of observation. Um, most of them today they call the Eulerian observation. And so the, the idea is that they are collected at a fixed site, ge geographically talking. Um, so I, I present here a very few examples. For instance, there are some moorings. Um, so this is very small, but um, that's the schematic representation of the mooring I was working on in, in Australia. So they were deployed off the east coast of Australia. Um, so basically, you've got a big weight here that and, and a float at the surface that maintain a line 
uh, with many temperature sensors along the line, and here you will have uh, ADCP, which is a, a device that measures the current. So this is a, a typical early end type of observation. It's in a fixed site and looking at the temperature and the current passing by through the, through the site. Another example is the stationary research vessel. So we, we, when we go at sea as oceanographer to collect data, we use big research vessel and we use this kind of device here that contain sensors of temperature, conductivity, current. Um, we can also grab some water sample. But to deploy this kind of, of instrument, the, the bots need to be stationary. We cannot be moving while we deploy this, this kind of instrument. So usually we go into the bot at sea and then we have some fixed station when we do the measurement. What's the size of that? These, these things, uh, I mean, they're different size, I would say maybe this big, maybe three meter diameter. Um, a, a last example is what we call the high, high frequency radar. Um, again, this is very small, but this is the coast of, of California here. And there is three sites on land, so where we put some mm -hmm. antenna on land that look at, I mean, send some, um, uh, um, some so, sort of radio signal onto the, the water and the surface reflect the, the signal and from that we can um, derive the surface current. But again, this is on a fixed grid and, and a fixed um, a geographical location. And then um, another way to look at the ocean is, is uh, in the Lagrangian way. And so in that case, it involves following a parcel of fluid. So the, the simplest example of this is what we call the SVP drifter. They are represented here, um, and here is the same thing in the water. So basically, you've got a buoy with a GPS here that sends the data and its position regularly uh, to a satellite. And underneath, you've got these socks here that you can barely see in, within the water. Uh, so this kind of socks that goes up to 10 meter, um, and that is supposed so the, so the drifter is supposed to flow with the top 10, 15 meters of the water of the ocean. Um, and so this kind of drifter can also measure SST, for instance. And so the idea of the drifter is they are supposed to move with the flow. Um, another type is Argo. They are not really a Grungeon because they do some movements in the water, but there are some phase um, underwater at the subsurface where they actually drift with the water uh, solely. And so as you can see here, for instance, what is SST? Uh, sorry, sea surface temperature. So they, they measure the temperature in the, in the surface. Um, and so, as you can see here, these kind of drifters, um, I, s I don't know, it probably started 30 years ago, oceanographers start to throw these drifters in the water, and you can see that there are quite a lot in it. So this is the um, density of drifter per, per square degree, and there are some area where you, you have more than 1,000 drifters or, or about 1,000 drifters in the ocean drifting around, and then we collect uh, trajectories, we can infer current, we collect also SST data, so temperature data and things like that. And of course, again, the physical connection between these two type of data is that um, if we put a drifter here and the flow moves that way, well, when the, when the drifter passes the, the mooring, uh, the temperature and the current detected by the mooring should be exactly the same as, as the one detected by, um, by the drifter. So these two specifications, they have also an influence on the way oceanographer model the ocean circulation. And so, um, here, all the realistic ocean models today, they, they basically resolve seven pri uh, primitive equations. Uh, so this is conservation of momentum, of mass, energy, salt, and the state equation. And so this type of equation, in theory, they could be resolved in both Eulerian and Lagrangian coordinates. Um, however, today, all the routine models, they use a fixed Eulerian grid. Um, so you have different type of coordinates, also an adaptive mesh. But they still, um, they, could, they call this kind of model semi-Lagrangian, but they're still resolving the equation in, in the other way. And so the fully Lagrangian model, um, for some reason, they, they still in development. They're not, they're not ready yet. Um, and I mean, the caveat here is that most of the oceanographic interests, or at least a lot of them, um, which are, for instance, revealing the flow pathway in the ocean, tracking the evolution of a water parcel. Uh, for instance, the, the transport of heat uh, through the ocean, uh, or studying ocean trusses. So again, that can be temperature, salinity, but also all the biogeochemical trusses uh, that can be dissolved or particulate. For instance, playing a key role in the carbon cycle, 
Well, all this question, uh, this seems more like a, like a Lagrangian type of question, where Lagrangian studies would be a natural framework to study them. And so a solution to this problem, and that's what I'm, I'm going to uh, present in this talk, is what we do is we used um, a layer model, and the, the output of this model are flow field, so really flow field. And so I will use the flow field derived from the layer model, but then I will do um, later offline algorithm studies. So the first example, um, so that's the work that was uh, published last year uh, that I just quoted. also. So I acknowledge all the, all the author here, and especially Gary and Christian that did pretty much um, most of the work. Uh, and so here we look at three-dimensional characterization and tracking of fabulous ring. So fabulous ring has some kind of, of AD um, observed in the ocean. So this animation, which is very nice, it's not mine. Um, that's from the GFDL. You can see this is an ocean model, uh, early end. So here's the tip of South Africa, the South Atlantic Ocean, Indian Ocean. And you have this current here, the Agulas current, that retroflects. And while it retroflects, it releases, you see these big eddies here as well. And so that's what we're going to study here, those, those big eddies. And so, um, why, why are we studying this is, well, because this system here uh, has been identified in the past as a, as a, crucial, uh, a crucial pathway uh, for the regulation of the global climate. And so this angular ring, these cities that I was talking, they are about 100, 200, 300 kilometers in diameter. They're quite, quite big structure. Um, so they transport warm and saline water from, from the Indian Ocean here. You, you could see before and also here that they are very warm water here. And they transport this water into, into the, the South Atlantic Ocean. Of course, other processes play a role in, in that transfer. There is simple advection or smaller scale structure. Uh, so what we call the Aguilas leakage, the transfer of properties through, um, through this uh, location here. Uh, but the rings, the, the, the peculiarity is that they are conservative structure. Um, so once they, they capture the water from the Indian Ocean, they are supposed to kind of keep this water conserved along their, their route. And they also travel very long distance. They've been uh, measured or observed um, off Brazil, so which is on the other side of, of the South Atlantic. So once they release from here, they travel a very long time and conserve their water in the in their core. And so, as I was saying, they have a key role in the global climate. Um, strong angular leakage have been uh, associated with the end of several ice age. So this uh, transfer of heat uh, through the globe have, have uh, very important uh, consequences for, for the regulation of the global climate. And so up to now, the existing techniques to characterize ED, they, they use essentially surface data. Um, so I, as we see before, or even on this SST image, so the sea surface temperature, you can see here the EDs that are characterized. And so there are a lot of techniques that look at how to characterize ED. And then one very important parameter is their decay. So how much, basically, is how much water is leaking of the structure. Um, also, this in the past has been measured indirectly. For instance, uh, they look at um, the gradient of sea surface temperature to locate the eddies, and then they look at how much this gradient evolves with time to infer a, a decay. But this is sort of an indirect measure. And so, what we're going to do here is the aim is to identify a coherent angular string, so coherent in terms of transport, so which will keep the water uh, inside its core conserve and we will also quantify its decay um, over time. So what we use, as I was saying, is the flow field from the early end model. Uh, so it's a global model. Um, it has a lot of years, but we use only uh, a few years of data. We locate just one structure. We use five-day average uh, velocities, uh, quarter degree resolution. And so this is a 3D uh, type of study. So we have um, 46 vertical layers. So here I plot some uh, sea surface high uh, data. So that's the, the uh, elevation of the sea surface. And so again, you can see here the, the strong current. And you can see that sometimes some, some edges are released and travel. And so that's, again, one of the, the techniques that people were using in the past, looking at sea surface high um, to locate edges. And so what we do is we, we visually examine the SSH field from the model. 
Um, and the idea is just selecting a region containing a very strong angular stream. So we, we locate one in 2000, which is here. Uh, so this is the tip of South Africa. Um, and, um, and we will track, track its evolution over time. So the material method, the, the concept uh, arises from the dynamical system theory and stochastic processes. And uh, so I refer to, to this publication by Gary uh, for more detail. Um, very, very briefly, the idea is that um, we, once we, we locate the, the structure, so say the edges here, uh, we will discretize the region, uh, so in 3D, so we build like three boxes of the, of the whole ocean around the structure. Um, and so we do that for its initial time and also for the final time, where it, where it end up before, uh, after a certain time. And in that case, we track its evolution over six months. Um, and then we use what we call a transfer operator. Uh, depending on the field, people use, use also the term of connectivity matrices. Uh, the idea is that um, we integrate Lagrangian particles. So we seed each boxes with a lot of Lagrangian particles. We, try, we integrate them over time. And then we, we build a matrix. Uh, and the entry of the matrix are the connection between one box in the initial set and um, another box of the final set. And so it tells you how much particles go from one box to another. And, and then there are some complex uh, methods that uh, I kind of uh, don't want to enter into detail. But the idea is that they normalize the matrix. Um, they construct a singular vector of this, uh, this matrix. And then with our convention, we've got the left singular vector that will give you um, the structure in the initial time, the right one will, will give you the structure for the final time, and then the magnitude of the singular values um, is a proxy of the coherence of the, of the structure. And so, um, to identify the, the coherent pair, we use the same structure and the a thresholding process um, to identify the structure, and this thresholding process is optimized through a line search procedure that will um, um, find the best threshold to extract the three structure with maximized coherence between the initial time and the final time. And so the, the first result and, and some sensitivity analysis that we, we, we had to do when we realized how, how sensible was the method, um, we realized that the integration time, the number of particles and the choice of, this, of the singular vector are very important here, um, mainly because of two problems. The first one is if we use too few particles and over a long integration time, we, we obtain unphysical disconnected image. So this little cartoon here is, is explaining the, the, the idea. Uh, this is a box, we see particle, we follow in time. Here it's okay, the, the, the image is connected, but if we follow for a longer time, it, it gets disconnected. Um, another issue that we had is that in the ocean, the horizontal velocity are two three order of magnitude higher than the vertical velocities. And so what we end up finding is that in the first uh, singular value, I mean in the second one, the, the, the strongest one, uh, all the structure, they appear on each vertical layer. So not a, not a, a three structure as a wall, but more um, a bunch of several structures on each layer. Um, so to solve this problem, um, so for the first problem, we actually uh, approximate the transition matrix over six months by the product of one month's matrices. Or we also did a sensitivity study of um, approximating the six month matrices by the product of two uh, three months matrices of transport. And um, so as you can see here, um, these are the, the um, singular vector uh, from six months, three months, and one month calculation. And you can see that they always capture more or less the same structure. Then, of course, the, the values are different, so the thresholding process will be slightly different, but uh, the structure is, is conserved. And to, to fix the second issue, what we did is we look at the, the following singular values. Uh, so we have a bit less coherence, but that will detect the whole three structure down to the, to the subsurface. Um, and so we had to look uh, up to the, the four singular value. Um, and to obtain a, a structure that was extending up to 700 meters in depth, which is more or less the, the range of, of the, the vertical extension of, of mesoscale. And so here are uh, uh, the true result where, uh, so here we've got longitude, latitude, and depth, so a kind of 3D plot. Um, and we see that our method detects a very nice 
Agula screen here, so uh, egg shape. Um, you can see that in, in the depths it's kind of being uh, sort of a conic uh, shape uh, underneath. And so what we can do is detect it at the initial time and at the final time. Um, we have shown also that it's quite a robust method because when we use different transport matrices, remember the product of six one months of, of two, three months, well, we detect very similar structure or almost the same as compared to the initial one. And the, one of the big advantages of this method is that we can also access uh, the leaking water. So uh, we can do a qualitative analysis, that's what you can see here. So all this cloud, um, the, the blue cloud here, represent the, the concentration of the final density. Um, and so we can look where the water leaking well is going, but we can also look how much of the mass remains in the structure. And so in that case, in that particular case, we found that 76% of the mass of the initial structure ended up in the, in the final one. And um, the 25 left are somewhere around. And so then how close are we as compared to the previous technique? I mean, are we just founding a structure that doesn't mean anything, or is that actually the real ring? For that, we just compare with all the previous techniques that people have been using, and most of them, they are Lerian. And so what we did is, here you have a velocity field, UV, a Lerian velocity field, and we compute um, two parameters that people have been widely using to, to locate these. So one of them is the relative opticity, uh, and the other one is the occupable waste parameter. And it's two-dimensional? Yes. For now, for, for this plot. And so for this plot, here is, I just, we just compare the surface in the area of the structure detected by our method and by other more commonly aligned method applied to make sure that we're actually looking at the same thing. And so here you've got longitude, latitude, this is a surface view. Um, and so our method is the blue line, uh, the SSH gradient, which I was mentioning before, is the simplest technique to locate it is actually the, the green one here. Uh, the occupable waste, the red one, and the relative opticity, um, the black one. And so we can see that they all superimpose more or less, so we, we're looking at the same, um, the same entity. Um, but they, they are slightly different, and we can see in the following that this slight difference are actually a, a very strong impact on how the decay of the structure is, is estimated. And so here, what I've presented in this table is the method of detection the volume of the structure and the coherence ratio. So the coherence ratio, remember what I said just before, is the, basically the percentage of particles that flow from the initial set into the final one. So it's a measure of the decay of, this, of the structure. And so in that case, what we did is we extend this surface method uh, into the vertical to be able to compare to our 3D characterization. And so here we used, again, what people usually use, it's just a, a threshold of, of the um, uh, occupable waste parameter of relative opticity. And, um, and so what we found is, uh, so it, it, I mean, we found the coherence ratio that is definitely much lower than, than our method here. So we've got 50% or 60% of, of coherence ratio when we detect the edges with this method. But one can argue that, um, as you can see here, the volume are very different. So maybe it's just because we are locating the core of the structure and those other techniques detect the boundaries, maybe, or, or larger boundaries. So what we did is we imposed to these uh, new techniques, I mean, to these um, classical techniques, um, we changed the threshold to impose that the, the final volume will be very close, very similar to our method, what we did here. And, and again, we compute the current ratio of this method, and um, it changed significantly for the occupable S parameter, it increased a little bit, uh, but not really for the relative opticity, and still we, we are still like 15% higher um, in the coherence ratio. So here I show that the transfer operator uh, approach gives a better representation of the AD in 3D, and so uh, the, this accurate delimitation of, of the 3D shape um, will be crucial to estimate the transport of the ADs, uh, the trans AD induced transport of tracers, um, and, and its decay over time. And so the perspective of this work 
um, is would like to use now uh, two different velocity fields. One which will be not 3D, just surface, but that will be observed, not, not model, so observation from satellite. So this is a sea surface high uh, from observed from satellite, where again you see all those eddies um, flow, flowing through the South Atlantic. And we like also to use higher resolution 3D model to, to look at the small scale processes. Um, and then uh, we'd like to improve the automation and routine application of these techniques. As you uh, probably noticed, there are quite a lot of steps where you actually have to, I mean, someone has to sit down and choose which single vector is the best, or analyze the sea surface high field. And so what we would like is, is try to find some parameters that will automate this. Um, and, and this is just a um, sort of a preliminary result. Um, so the, the, the um, colored contour is the detection of the eddies by our method on, on sea surface satellite field. And we see particles into it. And you can see that, again, most of them, they, they remain within the eddies. So it looks like a robust structure. And the one that don't remain, they, they actually stay behind. So the, the eddies is traveling faster uh, and will carry off all this property um, through the ocean. So a second example here of, of offline calculation and, and the advantage of the labyrinth technique is, uh, is this work that, that is in press at the moment. So uh, again, the, um, I acknowledge all my co-author here. Um, and so here we look at the multi projection of the pathway, uh, the Shima cesium radioactive plume. Um, and so the idea, I mean, you, you probably all know that uh, in March 2011, there was a magnitude 9, I think, earthquake uh, off the coast of Japan here. Um, and so this, this um, uh, earthquake triggered a tsunami a few, a few minutes later. Um, and all that together, they, they triggered this nuclear uh, disaster. So, of, I mean, of course, there was terrible consequences. I think now it's about 15,000 deaths or something like that. Uh, I mean, terrible consequences, which are, I will not talk about it here, but um, basically what happened is in the Fukushima nuclear plant, there were six reactors um, with chains. Three of them were already not, not working at the time of, of the earthquake, but the other three were actually um, uh, working. When the earthquake came, the, the three reactor uh, kind of collapsed, but then they had to to cool them down, so they, they, they put a system to cool them down. But then when the tsunami arrived, uh, it, it, it uh, break the system of, of cooling. And so, and so from, from this time, what happened is, so that you can see it here in the news, is um, well, a lot of uh, water was actually released into the ocean directly. And, and this water, that was the water that they used to, to cool down the reactor, uh, were highly con contaminated in, in radioactivity. And so the first report here, this is ap April, um, so you know, very, very early report, plenty of water being put in the ocean, we didn't know really what happened. Uh, then a few months later, um, so these two uh, magazines here, Science and Nature, uh, said that uh, probably this water will impact the marine life. Uh, but then um, in, Decem in December, there was still some, some news talking about um, th that the leak was going on. But at the same time, in early 2012, uh, there was peer review uh, studies that uh, went at sea, make some measurement, and, and they suggest that um, um, the, the radioactive level in the water were actually below the harmful level uh, within three months of the accident. So uh, it's hard to know, you know how, how bad it was, uh, because there was a, a lot of information there. Um, but here I'm trying to, to sum up the, the most important one. Um, and so what happened? In my case, is when this happened, I start to contact these people that were sort of next door in the UNSW. I know they, they were using some lagrimal models, so, so uh, I talk with them and we start this study. And uh, obviously, there are plenty of people that have the same ideas at the same time, so it's a kind of a historical um, a story of, of what happened. Um, so the main source, they are the direct release, so they, they use water to cool down the reactor, and this water was directly put into the ocean. And there is also some atmospheric deposition. So I'm talking about the ocean only here. Um, so the, the atmospheric deposition is coming from explosion that release some, some nucleotide in the atmosphere. And then through several processes, including the rain, 
um, this radio uh, radio liquid come back into the surface ocean. So that's the main source for the ocean for the ocean. Um, the main radionucleotide were iodine 131, cesium 134, and cesium 135. So here I put the half, half life of this uh, of this element. So the iodine is only eight days, so it's probably all gone by now. Uh, the cesium uh, 134 is two years, so it's, there might be still some, but um, I would say that's decreased quite a lot. But the cesium 135 is actually 30 years uh, half life. So it will remain for a long time in the ocean, and it will also travel very far. Um, so that's the one we're gonna we're gonna use to um, to track. Um, all these radionucleotides they are harmful for the health of humans and animals. Uh, for instance, the cesium uh, 135, the, the harmful level in the diesel phase are uh, about 10,000 becquerel per cubic meter. Uh, so this is very valuable with duration and impact of position. Um, and then how much cesium was actually um, released into the ocean? So that's, that's a big question. Um, and, and again, as I said, historically there was a lot, a lot of news uh, coming up. And so the first report was TEPCO, the company of um, the plant, that said, oh, it's about one petabecquerel. So petabecquerel are, are 10 to the 15 becquerel. Um, so that was in August 2011. So I was kind of starting, we were kind of starting the study. Um, and then the Japanese scientific agency suggests 15 uh, Peta Becquerel uh, in September 2011. And at the end of the year, um, so the French nuclear agency, uh, this one it was published, a peer review a publication, uh, they suggest 27 Peta Becquerel. And uh, of these 27, there was 22 during the first month. And, and the remaining was sort of diffused, and they, they didn't really know how to constrain. I mean, they didn't really know how long that it did, did it last and things like that. So that's the one, I mean, the end of 2011, where the time where we had the, the model ready and we were ready to do experiments, so that's the, the source function that we used here. 22, 22 beta becquerel for the first ones. Uh, for the atmospheric release, um, there are even more uncertainty probably, I mean, from 6 to 35 beta becquerel. Um, and so this is the release into the atmosphere, and for us, for the ocean, what is important is the deposition, and the deposition area was completely, I mean, varying a lot. Some studies would say, oh, it's just deposit on land and a few degrees of, of Japan, and some other study that would say it went onto the, the warm North Pacific, which is probably the truth because I think the, the transport in the air was, was much more rapid, and I think they, they, they detect some Fukushima derived nuclear in the atmosphere 15 days after mm -hmm. the after the, the accident in the US and in the northern hemisphere, it, it traveled quite, quite quickly in the atmosphere. Um, and then something I would like to mention, because I actually learned that when I, when I started this study, is the cesium doesn't exist in the natural state, so it's an uh, anthropogenic origin only. And it, it has been already, I mean, it is already in the ocean or the atmosphere for about the last six decades. And so this is coming from the nuclear weapon testing, nuclear accident, Chernobyl, for instance, and uh, radioactive waste. So uh, for instance, we can measure today some cesium that have been released 60 years ago uh, in the deep ocean. Um, and so here we will <coughs> neglect both the atmospheric deposition because of all these uncertainties that we, we don't really know what to do, and also the, the background concentration. Um, and also, I want to stress out here that this study is really um, dedicated to look at long-term and large-scale evolution of the Fukushima-derived uh, radioactive plume in the North Pacific. And we do not look at small-scale processes in, in, on the shelf of Japan, which a lot of photos have been doing, uh, where they look at precise transport pattern at a very small scale and for a few months. Um, so that's not what we're doing. So the material method, again, the idea is we use the flow field from the LIM model. Um, so here we use the ocean model for the air simulator. It's a Japanese model. Um, it's probably the, the best one for, for this region, for the North Pacific region. Uh, so it is resolving with high resolution. So all these cities are, are, very, um, are very important to redistribute trust in the ocean. So that's why we, we picked up this model. Um, quite high temporal resolution. 
And so what we use and what we add is the, seven, the 27 latest years of, of the available simulation. So we, we have diversity field from 1980 to 2006. Then cesium will be modeled as a conservative desorb processor. So that, again, there are a lot of studies um, in the past and also recent that consider uh, cesium as a passive tracer. There are some lab experiment um, that shows that uh, it doesn't really um, uh, get together with solid phase or particulate matter or something like that. Um, it's, it's not going through the, through the food chain either, apparently. So as a first estimation, again, we, we, use, we, we model that as a conservative uh, tracer. And so what we do is we, we use Lagrangian particle, um, so they are advected with a branch kuta integration scheme, and we advect that for 30 years, which is the, again the half time of the cesium. So it's at the end of our simulation, we have about half of the uh, initial concentration uh, gone. Um, and then what we do is simply convert the density of particle into uh, cesium uh, concentration. Of course, we model the natural radioactive decay. Uh, so for this, we just remove randomly particles here with a probability that corresponds to this uh, half-life of 30 years. And um, as I was saying, that we're not interested in the very small-scale coastal uh, distribution of the cesium. Um, what, we, what we use is a non-local source function to mimic the mixing effect of the non-resolved uh, near coastal current. So for that, each particle is, I mean, its location uh, of initialization is randomly chosen from a, a 2D Gaussian and so the, the Gaussian is centered on the plant and it has a decay length scale of about 30 kilometers which is the, the, the type of scale that we do not resolve here. And so as I was saying before, we use 22 Becquerel over the first month. Uh, yeah. Forgetting about my physics uh, lectures, uh, this is not very heavy. Sorry? So this is heavy, right? Yes. Expect, so we should see Quickly to the Apparently, that's to not. The it is really stable in the dissolved phase. So, in the space, on what, what happened, and I'm, I'm going to talk about it at the end, uh, where we do some sensitivity studies, is that sometimes it, it kind of gets into um, a particle, particulate matter, but in the ocean, yeah. and it kind of being with the particle, and then because the particle is very heavy, then it sinks. And so apparently that's the only mechanism that, it, that is, can have effects. But in the water, it really stays as dissolved. Probably would be a cesium plus, right? It's a cation. Right, you mean with it, with no, once in the water? Yeah, yeah. No, that's a meta, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it probably has some chemical reaction there. Um, but, but again, as I was saying, um, oops. Indeed, this is probably half or less of all the, um, the studies that use cesium as a passive tracer in the last 50 years. And all these studies have been compared with, with data. So here I'm talking about, for example, the Chernobyl accident or the French nuclear testing in the Pacific. Are, there was a lot of studies done on with that. And then they compare with data 30 years later and, and they conclude that uh, this assumption of modeling as passive tracer was a good assumption. Um, and so, so as I was saying, we use this source function. And remember, we don't have the velocity field in, in the future. So what we use is, is the 27 years of, of, sorry, of the circulation of the past. And we use this, this velocity field as an ensemble of, of simulation, an ensemble of 27 experiments. So the idea is, um, for each experiment, we use uh, 100,000 uh, passive Lagrangian particles and we release them over the first months of the disaster, so March um, 13 to, to April 13. And then we integrate this particle for 30 years. But so, because we just have 27 years, we have to, I mean, the idea we found is loop the velocity field. So, here's this little schematic, the first experiment is we see the particle over March, April 1980, and then we track them up to the end of the velocity field, and then at the end of December 2006, we come back uh, to January 80, and then we, we finish with the, the, the three years left here. And that's one experiment. And then we do the same with starting in March, April 91, and then again we look 
and we go a little bit further. Extra, extra, up, uh, until we have uh, 27 experiments. And so in all the rest on the, the, the following, I'm just presenting the ensemble mean of all these experiments. So I take all those experiments, all the results, um, average that, and that's what, what I'm going to um, present. And we also look at the standard deviation. So the, the ensemble mean, I like the robust circulation pathway and the viability gives the measure of the, the uncertainty. And so this can be done under the assumption that the, the circulation or standard circulation in the past 30 years is not really different to what we will observe in the next three years. And in that, in that area, it's quite okay assumption because apparently global warming, which might be the other source of non-natural viability, is, doesn't have strong impact in, in this area, in the North Pacific. So this is my movie, it's, it's definitely worse than the other one. <laughs> um, so this is the surface concentration um, of, um, of our um, Cesium, uh, simulated cesium, so latitude, longitude, this is Japan, um, and, that's, oops, sorry. and that's the most Pacific. So it goes pretty quick, but you can see it's directed um, uh, toward uh, the US here, you've got the gyre circulation. You can see that it's not really, um, um, it's not homogeneous uh, advection, you have, you, have, um, you have a jet inside, we're, we're going to come back later. Um, and then, of course, over time, so here we've got the time going on, uh, the concentration are decreases quite a lot, and it did quite quickly, and then it kind of spread everywhere in the basin, and, and then you can see it kind of get closer to the, to the Bunda. So here I, I just plotted a few snapshots. This is one year after the disaster, um, 2014, 2016, and 2021. So we're going to start here. Um, so what happened is, um, in our simulation, which was very consistent with the other database study, we found that in July, so that was four months instead of three months, in July, all the concentration everywhere were already uh, below 10,000 becquerel uh, per cubic meter, so which is quite consistent with this study. And why is that? Is, is because of this crucial current here uh, that is very energetic. Um, and a strong advection, a lot of mesoscale activity, a lot of eddies that disperse uh, the concentration of, I mean, um, fortunately, very quickly. Then, as I was saying here, we've got the supolar gyre circulation, so that kind of goes around like this, so that affects um, uh, the plume toward the, toward the US, but you can see that it's not a homogeneous advection, and we've got this jet here. So this, this jet that was consistent across the whole ensemble, um, and has been observed also in, in other studies, uh, will affect the, the, the plume faster uh, at about 40 knots. Then um, what we have is the uh, Ekman transport, so we've got trade winds in the middle of the Pacific that, that is responsible for this, um, for this uh, advection here of the plume uh, toward the south, and also the recirculation here that come back. Then once it reached the, the US, basically the two main pathways are going north here through the Alaska current, and so that will end up in the subantarctic gyre, which is this gyre up there, um, and going to the south in the California current. Here you can see that in off California, it's kind of stay offshore, uh, probably due to the coastal divergence of, of the upwelling here. Um, and then in 216, two again, what we have is the recirculation here, very strong. Um, and then 221 here, we can, we can look at the exit route. Uh, of this plume. And so the idea is that um, a, a little fraction went through the north and through the Bering Sea and then end up in the Arctic Ocean up there. Um, but most of it actually recirculate and either recirculate to stay in the dryer or start to exit. And the, the exit routes are through the Indonesian through flow. So this is the uh, Philippines and Indonesian archipelago. So it will go through here and end up in the Indian Ocean. Um, and another route is the Mindanao current here, which is a surface current that flows directly toward the equator. And, and then through the equator, there was also some, some transfer uh, into the South Atlantic. Here, uh, just very briefly, I, I access uh, one concentration here through the plume. And you can see that the spread between the ensemble is relatively small as compared to the concentration. And so that is telling us that at this scale, which, which are again large scale, 
uh, of course, I wouldn't say the same for a localized study, but at this scale, the initial condition is not really important, or at least the, the way we model the source function uh, was was um, was a good way because it's, it's not really uh, it doesn't have a strong impact. Um, so here you can see this uh, black line here along along the coast uh, of US, and so what I did is is I, I look at. Uh, what's happening here in this shelf area all, all over um, US. And so this is an off-border plot. You have latitude here, so this is latitude along the US coast, uh, and this is the time here. And um, from this plot, I extract just two time series, uh, which is, this is the concentration of, of uh, cesium, and this is time here. And so what you can see is um, there, the earlier contact here is about mid-13, is uh, north of 45. And so that, that was related to the jet I was mentioning before, uh, that affect very quickly the plume here. Um, the maximum of concentration is about 20, 30 per, per cubic meter, so it's far lower than any harmful concentration. Um, and that happened in late 14. And then the, the exposure, let's say above 10, it's more or less between 2013 and 2020 here. And we see clearly two regimes, uh, north of, of 45 and south of 40. And here you can see that the, the first contact is later, 2015. Uh, the maximum is lower, but the maximum stay longer. So here it's really peaky, whereas here it's not as, as strong, but it, it stay uh, elevated for a while. So we have about eight years of exposure, whereas here it was only six years. So how to explain uh, these this two differences between these two um, these two different uh, exposure. So for that, what we have to do is look at, at subsurface pathway. Um, so what happened is here we are again off Japan, um, and this happened in any ocean uh, of the world, I mean a lot of them, we have what we call uh, mud water formation. So this happened essentially at the end of winter and spring, after a lot of mixing and when the stratification is, is coming back. Um, so you have a lot of vertical mixing, and this dense water, they're, they're subduced. They subduct the surface water and they go into the, the entire ocean. And so some previous work, they identify several areas of subduction, as you can see here, uh, depending on the latitude. And each of these areas is associated with a particular water mass. Um, so here you've got the dense central mode water, the light central mode water, and the subtropical mode water. And so they are all characterized by a particular TS signature, temperature and salinity signature. Um, and so what we can see is there are several subduction area within 30 and 45 um, that lead to different mode waters. And if you remember the, the surface plume, that's exactly where, where it was. So, so we suspect that, that the plume would also sink into the ocean. And so to, to look at that, we, this is a surface slice in April 2014, but at between 400 and 600 meters. And so what you can see is, is again, this is exactly the, the area that uh, previous work identified as the area of, of subduction. And so here we have elevated concentration of, of cesium again. So um, the, the initial surface plume was flowing here at the surface, but at the same time it was, it was also going down. Um, and, um, and so what people have been, done, uh, have been doing is for each mode water, they associate a um, uh, density. Um, and so these are the density from the model here, 26 and 27. So 26 is associated with the light uh, central mode water and 27 to the dead central mode water. And you can see, so this is um, a section here. So here we're looking at north, south here. And this is a section um, at, at 160 east. And so you can see that there are two, two main core uh, of high concentration. Most of the subduction is happening north of, of 30 north, so which we're concerning essentially the light and dense central mode water, slightly the subtropical mode water, as you can see here, but not that much. Um, and so most of it is actually concentrated here around the 26 is a pine mode, so which is uh, the light central mode water. Um, yeah, and so this water basically uh, subduct and penetrate the entire ocean, and that happened during 2011 2014. And then kind of move into the subtropical, I mean, the, into the gyre circulation. And so it will move toward the subtropics and, and toward uh, the east of the basin. And so then when will it go? 
well, you might re-engage later. And so here, this is um, a section at 30 north, so here, uh, in 2014, so this is early. The surface plume, you can see, is traveling very fast toward the coast of US, but the deep penetration is still far behind. So in, in 2014, it's still sort of off Japan, offshore Japan, but going down. Um, and then most of the situation we actually followed is a pig model here. And so all this mud water that were created between 2011 and 2014, they will travel and re-image later along the isopignol here off the coast of California. And so that's what we found when we did in 2021 uh, a surface uh, view, but this is between 150 meters and 250. We can see this core here of high concentration that is essentially in the south and not really in the north. And, and so then, because here we've got trade wind and, and persistent upwelling, um, which source its water exactly at this depth, um, so what, what will happen is then the upwelling will, will, will source its water in this contaminated water and, and release the water into the shelf area for a while uh, and for, for a longer time. So to, to sum up, the northern shelf, we have the jet-like advection that creates the first impact with elevated concentration, but that doesn't last long, whereas the southern shelf, they were kind of protected from the first impact because of the upwelling and coastal divergence, but through subsurface pathway, they will, they will have a longer exposure because of this uh, sinking of contaminated water that travel across the basin and then come up um, about, about 10 years later. Um, so as I was um, there is a lot of uncertainty in the source function. And um, this work took time. Um, to be published essentially and so what, what happened is because it, it took a lot of time as I said there was a lot of photos also working on the same thematics and a lot of new papers were coming with a new source function all the time and, and the latest one uh, which is actually not yet published but it's in discussion um, they mentioned some data um, that suggest that the radioactive surface plume uh, with a concentration higher than 10 per metric have been measured at 40 knots at the international deck lane. So the, the deck lane is the, um, right in the middle of the Pacific. And so one great advantage of this uh, Lagrangian uh, experiment that would not be really possible with, with uh, earlier an experiment where you always have some kind of diffusion term that you cannot really scale. Um, here, because it's just trajectories, it's kind of a linear world, so we can just rescale our, our result to fit the data. And so that's what I've done here. Again, here we've got the concentration and the time. Um, so this is the sort of the disaster happening, and this is April 2014, so it's in the first few years. Here, this is um, the, what we model originally with the source function of 22 becquerel per meter cube at 40 knots. So first of all, I, I access other latitudes, 35 and 45, and we can see that the maximum is 40 knots. So it seems that at least our current simulate well the, the latitudinal location of the plume. But these, those are the data measured by those guys. Um, obviously, we are um, overestimating a lot the concentration. And so here, what you can do is simply find the scaling factor that make our concentration here, the dotted line, fit the data. And so from this factor, you can re-estimate through a, a, an inverse estimate the total release. And in that case, we found that instead of 22, if we want to fit the data, we would have to, to use a source function of 3.3 uh, meter. And so this is what uh, is available today, which was not at the time of the study, is um, the main estimation of the source function. And so you can see it's changing a lot. I mean, it goes from one peta per meter cube to 27. So the 27 was one of the upper range. Um, and our new inverse estimate, which is of 3.3, is really within the range of, of all this variability. So it doesn't look um, too bad, at least. And um, just to mention, I mean, it seems like it's still going on the leak because so end of 2012, science uh, say was still leaking. In March, there are some uh, paper again under discussion uh, based on data that they measure some radioactivity 
uh, this is in June and this is yesterday in Le Monde where they again talk about some, some kind of flicking. So here we really see the advantage of these Lagrangian techniques uh, in a way because you, it's, it's really much more flexible than, than, than a Eulerian uh, type of experiment. So here, very briefly, the other source of uncertainty, the modeling choice, we, we test the impact of the looping uh, velocity field. We didn't find a, a big impact. Um, the artificial diffusion added on the trajectories, we've been asked also to do this kind of, of experiment, which we did, and what, we, what it does mainly increase the recirculation, so the, the fact that the, the plume doesn't go straight to the US, but kind of recirculate more. Um, but, but the argument here why we didn't do it is because in that kind of large scale study we use a one tenth resolution uh, model which is quite high resolution and so just this, this um, uh, mesoscale result by the model is enough um, to, to represent um, the real diffusion in the ocean. Then the neglected processes, of course the atmospheric deposition will be probably one of the most um, impacting uh, processes that we have neglect uh, and so what it can do is of course increase the surface concentration because it just arrived on the surface and potentially also the mold water formation if uh, some of the deposition occur in the area of mold water formation that, that I was mentioning before. Um, and then uh, that's coming back to your question, all this interaction of cesium with the solid phase also there is a lot of, of um, complex processes with the sediment uh, well, all this will have an effect, but essentially probably uh, in the coastal area because of the shallow water, because of the proximity uh, of the sediment, and also because of the um, very um, rich water in terms of particulate matter, which might interact uh, with uh, cesium. But probably not that much in the middle of the Pacific where the water is very transparent and almost nothing there. Um, and then we also look at natural variability, but I won't really talk about that now. Um, and just to conclude is these kind of studies, um, I think it's really useful and essentially because it will allow validating the ocean model for the pathway but also for the parameter because most of the ocean model today they parameterize the mixing of the subgrid processes. Um, and so this kind of data and this kind of simulation will be very useful in the, in the next 10, 20 years to actually compare and see how, how good are our model over the over decade. And so this is just a brief conclusion. Uh, so Lagrangian flag fan club. Um, here's the we show is high occurrence of a three-year congenity. Uh, it allows direct tracking of the decay. It is a scalable and flexible technique. Uh, very well suited to problem with high gradients involved, um, as compared to the Eulerian uh, type of studies. And and I was seeing it as direct oceanographic meaning and, and interpretation. Um, and so a few perspectives of the work I'm doing now. Um, so with Enrico, we do, we're looking at coral ocean corals um, in, in the Mediterranean Sea for the moment. With, with Joao, we look at, at uh, upwind filament and, and also future application to biological relationships. So as I was saying, in the South California, for instance, it might not really reach the real coastal area, essentially because of the upwelling. It might reach the outer shelf, probably. Um, but yeah, I don't know if, if they are doing any type of measurement. But for instance, the, um, it's again, it's another work, but there are a lot of Lagrangian applications. Is the you know all the debris from the from the, the tsunami and all the boat and uh, the cars and whatever that went into the, the ocean, then they also travel and, and there are some guys that look at that. So here's a bit different because they will be surfaced and really influenced by the wind. 
pattern. So there are some people that in our life or some that study this, how, how long and uh, how fast it will travel. And I think they use uh, this kind of data where people were reporting, oh, we found this on the beach or we're coming from the Fukushima disaster to rescale their, you know, their approach and, and their model. Yeah. Well, apparently, so apparently, what I was saying is, um, he, three months after the disaster, they, they had uh, most of the, the, the sample, either sample of seawater or also from the flesh of a few organisms, were far below the, the harmful level. Um, and then what's, what's happening in, in the very coastal area, here you probably have even today, and that's what the, the latest um, news were, was suggesting, is that in the very coastal area, very close to the plane, there are, because there are still some, some water that, that is released. And this water also, where, which I did not mention, but could come from the rivers or from you know, soil erosion, like the rain on land and bring all the things that were on the, on the land into the ocean. And so this will probably play, play a role, but it, I think it's a very different scale. It's very local, or close to the coast. As a large scale, it probably doesn't have any, as far as we know, I guess. Good question.